welcome. Um, I'm Eugene Brennan, and today I'm pleased to host Abdul Malik Simone for a talk titled At the Extensions Urban Life Within and Beyond Capture. This talk takes place in a series we've been running at ULIP on critical theory in times of crisis. Um, and in this context, Abdul Malik's work provides an invaluable source for thinking with and through contemporary crisis. His latest book, Improvised Lives, dwells with the forms of possibility discovered within urban crisis. In particular, it considers how the intensified uncertainties of urban life might lead people to not only defend particular territories of interest, but as he argues, use the dispossessions they may experience in such conditions, repurposed in open-ended and experimental ways. Abdul Malik thus develops the notion of the uninhabitable as method. If urban spaces are increasingly hostile to habitation for the many today, Abdul Malik identifies within urban life spaces and times which, in their inability to be precisely measured or scaled, weaponize a kind of opacity or indistinguishability, providing what he calls rhythms of endurance. He develops the idea of the uninhabitable as method to study practices of living with the urban, in his words, and all its intensifications, extension, ambiguities, and apocalyptic implications as something strange, seemingly impermeable to calculation. This work thus points to a kind of already existing, perhaps everyday politics that, that points to the ways in which people are already seeking to evade capture. Improvised Lives is a book which personally I often take notes as I'm reading. Uh, like many, I'll kind of pick out key quotations that I want to copy out and come back to later on to dwell with. Um, but reading Improvised Lives, I found myself virtually copying out the whole book because every sentence is a kind of a, a powerhouse of ideas, as is often the case in which of Abdul Malik's writing. So it's an honour to be presenting him today for work that follows on from this and relates to his forthcoming book, The Surrounds Urban Life Within and Beyond Capture, forthcoming from Duke University Press. Abdul Malik is author of also many other books, including Jakarta, uh, Drawing the City Near, and New Urban Worlds, Inhabiting Dissonant Times, co-authored with Edgar Peters, to name only some of his more recent works. He's currently Senior Professorial Fellow at the Urban Institutes, University of Sheffield, and Visiting Professor of Urban Studies at the African Centre of Cities, University of Cape Town. He's worked all over the world with not only universities, but various municipalities, research groups, and social movements on issues of urban transformation. Before I hand you over to Abdul Malik then, just want to say uh, one or two brief notes. So firstly, this is the last talk in the Theory and Crisis series this year. Um, thanks very much to everyone for following throughout the year and to all the speakers who contributed. We had planned on doing one extra session in June, but have had to postpone this until the next academic year. Um, and that's perhaps for the best. So we'll come back uh, refreshed from a summer break from Zoom. I'm pleased to say we've already got an exciting lineup um, of confirmed speakers so far for next year, including Veronica Gago, Brenna Banzer, Sandra Masadra, and Engen Eisen. So I look forward to confirming details uh, for you of that in the fall. Um, however, this is not the last ULIP event this year because we've also got uh, Dr. Min Kyung Lee, who's been curating a really exciting uh, a program as part of her Bannister Fletcher Fellowship at ULIP. It's a program focused on the quantification of urban space. And next Tuesday, there'll be a roundtable discussion titled Speculation and Mismeasures, featuring Abdul Malik back with us, the pleasure of welcoming him twice in the space of a week, along with various other um, really interesting speakers. So uh, I'll put the link in the chat box for that event shortly. It's this coming Tuesday, the 25th, and um, you can register online on the ULIP site and um, uh, follow along. So back to today then, um, and as usual, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So please do enter your questions or comments. I will try and get through them after the, the talk. Um, but for now, it's my honor to hand it over to you, Abdi Malik. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the generous introduction. Um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, be with you all today. Um, well, what I'm going to try to do um, this afternoon is to 
link some of the, the kinds of um, themes and problematics that have been taken up in this seminar so far and try to link it directly to a series of, uh, of urban, urban, pro and urban problematics. Um, so in some sense to, to think through the kind of emergent spatialization of urbanization, uh, particularly within uh, South and Southeast Asia, um, as a way of thinking about larger issues of political and, and conceptual conceptual possibilities. So I'm 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 dealing to I'm I'm dealing with series of particular conditions. And these conditions are that the, 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 that the specific histories of a range of different metropolitan regions across what I call southern latitudes um, have made visible a sense of multiplicity to the logics and arrangements and constellations of power which did and could inform processes of urbanization. So the importance in some sense of, of, a, of a notion of Southern urbanism, if such a thing exists, was in some sense to widen the scope of how we think the urban is constituted and how it takes place. So not cities of the South as any kind of a brand or a category, but heterogeneous sites of conceptual inversions and reversals and empirical diffractions that flesh out a sense of the urban as, a, as, as pluriversal. And so for example, um, the Delhi and Karachi and Jakarta and Calcutta are particularly on my mind today, but also in Cairo and Bangkok, Lagos, Douala, Kinshasa, Johannesburg, where I've worked, but also cities like Manila and Lima and Mexico City, where I have where I, I have I have not. Um, but it's these it is it is these urban areas in, in in which I have in mind as the kind of empirical locus for the kinds of reflections I'm going to try to uh, to make today. So the conditions also entail that that current trajectories of of urban change that normatively emphasize security of tenure, propriety through property, inclusiveness through debt, and on the equation of affordances with affordability, and the enforced promotion of resilience through the attenuation of social contracts have had a kind of debilitating impact on the sociability of city life. So, I mean, the, the sort of normative political technologies through which urbanization increasingly proceeds in some ways has, 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 a, has a deleterious effect on, on the social. And that these political technologies of apparent stability disentangle various solidarities, collaboration and economies that have been built on the continuous recalibration and plying of relations among different kinds of actors and activities. The majority of these cities inhabitants are increasingly living and operating in spaces beyond traditional settlements of what conventionally is understood as the urban core. So in some sense, the, the increasing the majority of, of, of residents, of the majority, the, you know, the working class, lower middle class, working poor, uh, increasingly find themselves at the, at the extensions rather within, within the ur urban core. And that these extensions are saying something different and uncertain, not only about urbanization, but inhabitation itself, about its sensibilities and its politics. So it's not just a sort of, it's not just a, a, a demographic move, it, 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 it's fundamentally, interrogating what does it mean to inhabit, uh, what does it mean to inhabit? And extensions pose critical questions about relations, scale, temporality, uh, 
and the incipience of differences without separability to invoke the notion of Denise Ferreira de Silva. And I'll, and I'll come back to that later in, the, later in the talk. And then there's certain provisos here. This is not so much a talk about the urban. It's not so much delving into the never ending controversies about its constitutive processes. Rather, it uses the urban or the consideration of a particular facet of it to think about how the possibly existent practices and spaces, which will always determinately be subsumed in one way or another to capture enclosure and interdiction hierarchy, but how these practices and spaces continuously prefigure different form, different, a different mathematics evaluation and, and, and anticipation. So in some ways to use the, 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 the empirical sense of the extensions as a way to think through a different modality of what it means to value and what it means to, uh, to emancipate. And while extensions are theoretically limitless, I mean, where do the extensions begin? Where do they end? Um, you know, once something is extended, where, where, you know, how far does it go? What are, what are the boundaries of it? It's, it's not the point to, to define, uh, to impose a particular kind of border. But the talk does have in mind as an empirical platform for analysis and speculation, what are commonly called the extended urban regions of the metropoles of South and Southeast Asia. And this is not a kind of area studies, but it's a consideration of how things branch off, um, how they bring new improbabilities into the world in the midst of different kinds of forces entering into some kind of relation. And so there are no exemplary or predominant extensions, particularly because these extensions seem to imply a kind of continuous unsettlement, uh, both debil and both debilitating and generative dispossession. So a sense of, of the, that, that in some ways the extensions in themselves embody a kind of ongoing process of unsettlement, something that refuses to settle, refuses to be known in, a, in, 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 in one particular way. And so it's not some sense of, not, not a notion really of sprawl, but of, you know, to, to sort of use on a Singh's notion of patchy, patchy contiguities, things side by side in all kinds of strange alliances. Um, and so, you know, the extensions include, you know, built environments as, as different um, and as complex uh, and dispersed as, 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 in these, as in these images. Okay, so these conditions also are, are informed by histories, sense of history. So if we look at the notion of extensions, the colonies were themselves often considered as extensions of particular territories, regimes and missions. As extensions, they were both within and outside the normative laws of the colonizing state. They were to be domesticated under the prevailing rubrics of administrative practice and moral sensibility incumbent to that state, but also were treated as domains where their purported radical difference would warrant various exceptions. Whatever existed in the extensions could become objects of theft, either because the inhabitants were not capable of recognizing the real value of what was stolen, or that they were incapable of exercising the kind of mastery necessary to convert these objects into property. For the realization of property requires such objects to be enrolled into a specific agenda imposed upon them that is distinguished and maintained by force as irrevocably separate from others. Again, this, the importance of this notion of separate separability, differences without separability, and whose relations are primarily characterized by the logics of exchange and price. As objects were often held in common or engaged as interlocutors, 
where human inhabitants needed to be sensitive to the wants and needs of such objects, property was a conceptualization often far removed from every, their everyday sensibilities. As such, in the eyes of the colonizer, things could be taken, even if those things might be critical to material and cultural functioning of inhabitants, because they were not anyone's property, and thus theft was not an issue, because there was no property, there was no property to, to, to basically steal. And this was to have even more drastic connotations in the way in which life itself then would be, would be taken. So the extensions far from embodying the connotation of stability and moral coherence that colonizers presumed to impose were spaces of intensive volatility, saturated with brutality and an entanglement of terror and pleasure. The terror of the extent to which brutality could engender pleasure and the pleasure accrued through the terror entailed in the suspension of principles and order. In many instances, it is difficult to discern the difference between them as any sense of unity among self and subject has been torn apart. And such disjunction is the result of constant intrusion and intersection and interdiction. So given these conditions, given these histories, the particular problematics that I have in mind are these. That the extensions upend settled ontological dispositions of the city. The, the, the presumption of the city to crystallize human potency to arrange natures, its claim to embody the will of free individuals. Rather, the extensions are speculative futurisms in that they constitute alternative readings of what might take place within a specific order of things. Additionally, the city or the predominant readings of the city have been excessively preoccupied with settlement. And even while the, 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 this vast range of what's called mobility studies has emerged over the past three decades to counter the hegemony of this preoccupation, there remains an underappreciation of the dominance of movement uh, across urban life. Uh, but people have always moved. And instead of viewing movement simply as a descriptor of transport and conveyance, the activity entailed in shifting bodies from one location to another, human movement is consonant with the fact that all matter constantly moves. And whatever stabilization indeed emerges is not the cessation of mo movement, but the capacity of different things to move with each other in a, in a consistent fashion. So the city as the consolidation of the property land of populations with individuated properties demonstrated through citizenship of densified spatial functionalities and economic aggrandizement and the maximization of value added activity is extended, but it is extended through the continuous everyday abruptions and upheavals of this very consolidation. So it's not a kind of replication, it's not an extension of a kind of coherent logic that then retains its coherence, but, but, but it, it, the, the city is being extended or the urban is being extended through the very upheaval of the very kinds of logics at work in terms of consolidating the city itself. And so what this upheaval then does is that while it may be increasingly unclear in the proposition that coloniality persists across many urban regions about just who is colonizing whom and what forms of power are occupying and steering the processes of ongoing urbanization, practices of theft remain unabated, but so do instances of incomputable sharing. And so you have the, simultaneous, the, the, the simultaneity of, of of the ramifications of this up upheaval being manifested both in a, a kind of intensification of theft, but also an intensification of, of things coming together and, 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 and affecting each other in ways that is, is not easily computable or not, easy, not easily framed. So those are, those are the, the, the that's those are the sort of key key problematics about 
extension through this kind of process of abruption and uh, upheaval. But if we're to take, for example, the these these vast areas on the in, in the in the in the extensions of Calcutta, for example. Just some some images of 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 these of these these areas, which are quite quite vast, uh, and and over the past 20, 20, 25 years, doesn't mean that extensions that extensions still are caught up and caught in colonial imaginaries of spatial production, and this is reflected in 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 these points. There is the, vi the violence entailed in the assumption that there's nothing there, or what is there is an anachronism, something whose time has come or gone is in need of being rectified or is, is or no longer useful. I mean, which sort of, it, it, it approaches the sort of notion of the, of, the, of the frontier, that there's nothing, that there's nothing there, or what is there is no longer has, has value. Um, that the extension is that there's something uninterrupted, unimpeded, not to be contaminated or belabored with the intrusions or proximities of other ways of, of living. You know, the, fan, the fantasy, the fantasy of, of, the, of the enclosure, uh, of a way of life that can proceed outside of the kind of messy labor, belabored negotiations with, with others. Also in the sense of repetition, as if something is being prolonged, extended regardless of the situation, and which seems to address everything that one might need, everything immediately accessible. I mean, this is often the promise of many built environments amongst the extensions. Everything is here. You just have to take the elevator down and you'll have your, your clinics, your schools, your, you know, every, everything is available. And then also a sense of belonging to the world the larger world, uh, removed from the messy entanglements of, of lo local situations. But there's also within the extensions, the liminal spaces opened up in the absence of clearly consensual plans of development. The spaces between all the stops and starts, all of the incompletions, which allow for various forms of projects to emerge from the background, a background that includes sediments of past uses and histories, intensive contestations of land, waged through complex brokerage of social and racial identities and countervailing claims. So no matter, so, so no matter how unfettered, no matter how clean, no matter how elegant the extensions are, may seem on the surface, they often are the products of really messy kinds of churns and interchanges and remakings of long, histories of, uh, of struggles and contestations, um, uh, which in some sense continuously buttress themselves against whatever, whatever appears, and also is necessary, as I will say later on, oftentimes necessary in order to make these kinds of extensions actually, actually work. Extensions are also coupled with, with systematic depletion and, and devaluation. Um, and, and particularly salient points here, you know, that come from my colleagues at the, at the Karachi Urban Lab, is that an increasing numbers of urban dwellers are, are seen as encroachers. And because there are, they are encroachers, it is also accompanied with this sort of purposeful foreclosure of the technologies of counting and, and documentation that would enable these particular urban dwellers to indeed count, to indeed narrate a history capable of, of exerting legitimate claims. But because they're deemed as encroachers, they're foreclosed the possibility of being able to use the very narrative tools that would enable them to make themselves legitimately visible in some way. And where the dependence on improvised arrangements of valuation, use, and regulations as tools for po possessing territory is itself defined as not having the right to be in possession of certain documents, 
or that the documents that residents may be in possession of that give them some sort of legitimate claim were issued by authorities that are now deemed not to have had the authorization to issue them at that time. So even if people have papers and documents that give them particular kinds of rights and claims, existing governments may say, oh, well, that's, that's interesting, but, the, but you got these from, from authorities that weren't authorized to issue them in the first place at that time. And then this increased use of eminent domain and overarching public purpose as tools of displacement, supplemented by policies in which residents, because they're deemed as encroachers, are seen as voluntarily abdicating their rights to make claims. And then the increasingly expansive role of judiciaries, not so much as an arbiter of claims, but to instantiate the priority of order above and beyond the rights to land, livelihood, and shelter that the law might provide. So it supersedes existing planning processes and reifies planning tools that otherwise would function as heuristic instruments, now as blueprints to be legally inscribed. And this, this often coincides with the proliferation of non-democratic local authorities and ambiguous judici ju jurisdictional boundaries. To whom does the extensions belong to? Who has the right to exercise particular regulatory functions, disposition of land, um, the, the demarcations, the, the competencies are often left highly ambiguous as a way in which to uh, conduct a kind of process of transformation largely under, un, un, under, under the table. So these are the ways in which a certain kind of coloniality persists in, in, within, the, within the confines of the, of, of the extensions which become spaces of expanding complicity and in some sense, everything, everything for itself. Now, there's also a kind of temporal, a, a temporal aspect to, the, to this notion of extensions. So think of, think of it when you, to, to receive an extension, it actualizes the promise of finitude that something can come to an end, that a debt can be paid off, and that solvency remains intact. That is, there's a deferral of reckoning, but also the postponement of a sense of a conclusion that's repeatedly extended. So you receive an extension, it's a promise that you've, you can bring this thing to an end, uh, that you can keep your solvency because you're not gonna, you're not gonna completely be knocked off or, or bankrupted at the time, you postpone it, it's extended, uh, but it, it, it maintains the promise of something that can be settled, that there can be a kind of settlement. But at the same time, the obligations and the debts remain unsettled within this promise. So what happens is a kind of borrowing from the future with or without penalty a deduction, a tariff. The city goes on to live yet another day. Yet everything has to be speeded up in an interval that straddles two, two due dates. There is something past due, something past due both reaffirmed and diluted where the past now must be addressed in a new way. You're gonna to have to pay that thing. You have to find a way to pay that thing and that that past won't let go, but also that requires now a new orientation, a new pace and rhythm within what is both a contracted space for the extension is not limitless and experimental. You have to try something new in order to now meet the deadline. So there's still, there's a possibility of owing never brought to an end for what is the basis to ask for an extension? It entails evidence of both capacity and incapacity, a redoubling of owing as one owes the person granting the extension. So the loan shark of which many of, many of the urban majority relies on that issues continuous loans to finance the paying back of prior loans at increased interest on a principle 
that can never probably be paid. And so it's a spreading culpability of endless reminders involving sisters and cousins. The loan shark just doesn't come to you who owes, it comes to now everyone that you know as a way of expanding the, 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 the field of, of pressure on you. And so extortion entails an enlarged audience of indebtedness in exchange for protection from those who would, who would be the very ones to extend their protection. And so what one finds in, in particularly in, in places like South Africa, Brazil, and Indonesia, in which a kind of middle class came to existence largely through debt-fueled consumption, and now faces you know, a life of, of never being able to really pay back that debt, installs a process of generalized plunder to take one can from to take what one can from any other, to extend the terrain of theft. And so the one's social field becomes increasingly, well, what can I get from you? What can you get from me? What? So it becomes a kind of theft of orientation in this game of extensions, a theft of orientation. So then the question becomes, so where are we then? And who are we? And what is a we anyway? I mean, if, if there's a, if, if a sense of orientation is being stolen, then who are, who are we? Um, and, 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 and what is a we? And so here, in some sense, there's a kind of process of extending time that has everywhere become situated in increasingly larger frames of reference in terms of how a place regards itself its future prospects or is relegated to the margins. The standard components of urbanization, the maximization of ground rent, the individuation of action and inhabit, uh, individuation of action and inhabitants, the multiplication of territorial operations, the financialization of materialities, and the mediaization of the social sphere, all of these have a certain kind of traction because they become accessible answers for these dangerous questions. These dangerous questions about who are we, where are we, what is, what is, a, what is a we? So this kind of process of theft of orientation is responded to through a certain kind of series of standardized answers. Um, which I see, which are the, the kind of standardized components of, of, of urbanization. But what happens? Well, the rush to the, the, the rush for these answers, the, the rush to take these kind of available answers in compensation for this theft of orientation results in a kind of rush to build, a rush to acquire the profusion of tipping points through which all kinds of projects fail and come and go, the rapidity of land conversions coupled with the, the obdurate resistances issued by varying logics of claim, whether they be claims of spiritual, ancestral, or pretended claims on land or resources, the dissipation of interest in particular sites or projects, the way in which you know, money oftentimes comes into particular built environments and then because it doesn't go according to the speed or the plan is immediately pulled out. Um, the resurgent feedback of materiality, the ways in which extensions are subject to infrastructural collapse, to floods, uh, the enfolding of contradictory modalities of livelihood within single regulatory frameworks, and the silent complicities between different categories of residents, all of these intersect to produce the extensions as oscillating differentiations of speeds where it is difficult for anything to take hold, anything to become a whole. So yes, you have this kind of, this, this kind of outlay of the standardized urban political technologies as answers to the, to, this kind of theft of, 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 or, of orientation, but the actual processes of implementation are much more messy and all over the place. And so it's difficult for any particular kind of design or project really to take hold. 
or to become a kind of whole, to become a kind of platform, to become a kind of settlement, to become a kind of enclosure or, or capture. And so you have a kind of situation that approximates what Glissant would have called the sort of incommensurable simultaneity, where re relations that are disruptive of perspectives rather than confirming them, where residents are exposed to the non-transitive details of a larger world, to landscapes, built environments, and events as incommensurable details open to gatherings that are not easily framed or subsumable to existing categories. And so there's a kind of deferral of definitive framework and the leveraging of emergent effects. The valuation of intensities not subjected to pre-existent entities as the force of, of transformation. And so here we, there is some then kind of, there's some resonance with the way in which extensions uh, the way in which extensions have been in some sense enriched by the thinking of, of, of black study. Um, and so when, when I mean, uh, Sheila and Bembe talks about the becoming black of, 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 of the world, but here I want to sort of focus on the way in which at a global level, um, blackness continues to operate as a mode of managing the intensified urbanizations of populations, increasingly circulating across territories and provisionally anchoring that circulation in various lengths, residencies in towns and cities. And here one finds that from Eastern Indonesia to Northeast India, to the Mediterranean, to Brazil and Peru, Blackness is increasingly mobilized to filter, to interdict, to read, and to channel circulation, as well as to prefigure more experimental solidarities. So within this kind of theft of orientation, within the theft of the ability to, in some sense, conceptualize one's future life as settled within a particular place. And so one is disp displaced one has to try to think about one's livelihood and future on the run or in a process of ongoing circulation. Blackness is also mobilized as a way to think through particular forms of experimental solidarities of people within circulation. Um, not, just, not just to, yes, to continue to filter, to interdict, to read and to channel, but also to prefigure more experimental ways of perhaps being a we. And these experiences reiterate the conceptual conundrums that have long inscribed black, black populations in what could be considered a logistical exigency of both affirming and effacing the coherences engineered through blackness. Desubstantializing the normative implications, well, also generating a positivity through extensions beyond the recognized integrity of subjects. So here the notion of extensions moving across within the earth, a movement of deterritorialization in a, in a movement of deterritorialization. So if the advent of blackness is the state of capture rendered as an unrelenting ontological condition, where the state of being black is to have been constitutionally made available and worthy of capture, and where subsequent generations of being black, even if not subjected to enslavement or incarceration, still renders them fundamentally available to premature death, engineered explicitly or implicitly on the basis of their being black, that beyond capture cannot register a positivity with its own within its own terms, but always had to play off the presiding architectures of captivity. So this is the kind of the, 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 this is the connection I want to make between this kind of, of, of history, the history of blackness and the kind of emerging sensibility of these urban extensions. And this did not mean that Blacks lack the capacity to materialize memory into new versions or fail to offer collective visions about life worth living or economic practices capable of underpinning specific imaginations. 
it, it didn't mean a, a lack of capacity to posit positivities, but rather there was always a diligent awareness of shared vulnerability that all black inventions could not institutionalize themselves according to the normative procedures of transparency and dissemination without inviting assault and denigration. So it's in a sense, a matter of logistical dexterity. And I use that notion of logistical on, 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 on purpose here. The process of disembedding particular, particular nodes, transit and processing sites from the specificities of their relationships with particular locales and demographic compositions and social economic histories and cultural practices requires a kind of open-ended sense of how these sites now acting as nodes could be articulated in new and various ways. I, I'm, not, I, I'm, not, I'm not offering a kind of counter to the sort of conventional notion of logistics as a kind of extended reproduction or, 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 or as a violence, but somehow th that there is a kind of logistical sense in somehow detaching from particular kinds of frameworks in order to open up new ways of, of interrelating things. And so it entails how they are multiply situated in a plurality of different circulations. This is a process that reiterates the fundamental instability of interconnectivity, as well as a potential space through which resistance and illicit uses might emerge and thus require capacities to anticipate instability and preempt and preempt interruptions. I mean, and, and, and in some ways to, to, to then to step aside from, 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 from this, that a kind of a, a, a reworking of these kinds of relationalities is particularly, I think, is particularly imperative in terms of how we think about the, the urban, urban today. Uh, I mean, as Franco Berardi emphasizes, the, the rescaling of salient force to the level of planetary climate conditions and to the micro registers of biomes and toxins and viruses, registers which are increasingly articulated through techno semiotic calculation. All of this, this rescaling to sort of planetary crisis and the rescaling to the sort of nano microscopic level constricts the operations of politics as a means of constituting free citizens long affiliated with the city. And as such new interplays, new relationalities within and among registers are needed as a means of multiplying entanglements amongst things, the relations of mutual implication and the directionalities of collisions beyond the specifications of algorithmic determinism. And so again, to return to the extensions, not as fractal replication of format or formula, but the emergence of these kinds of new entanglements. And this is particularly, this is particularly important uh, in, in many urban regions of the South because it's reflected in a growing and practical dissipation of the desire, particularly on the part of youth for property a kind of lessening of the, of the emphasis of the accumulation of assets as consumption has reached a kind of glass ceiling. Now, people still wanna get something, people still wanna attain something, it's still on the cards, but what, is, what, is the, what seems to be a kind of increased emerging desire is for operational maneuverability as selves and households and affiliations spread out and consolidations to use Fela's term, scatter, scatter. Um, they, again, not being settled, continuously circulating, continuously trying to, to interact and find openings in the midst of all of these attempts and oftentimes violent attempts to frame them. And also because in some sense, increasingly new sites of affordable residence are unlikely ever to consolidate themselves into viable economic and social territories. I mean, if you look at the, the massive outlay of so-called affordable housing across the extensions, you know, these small little 40 square foot pavilion houses that are, that are you know, people 
have within the past 20 years rushed to get a hold of because it's a kind of asset. Oh, I have a piece of property. I have something to anchor me. I have to, you know, most of these places aren't going to last 10 to 15 years. And then they're, they're, they're so badly constructed, they're gone. Or developers who built them and were to turn them over to mis municipalities, municipalities don't even want to, to govern them. And so where people are coming, where people are coming from is, is, is increasingly broken and where people are going to will probably never be enough and something that is no longer enough. So how you exist within these kinds of interstices where, where you come from is broken, where you're going to will never be enough. And so you live in the kind of midst of, of a kind of brokenness. And so value, what's valuable increasingly becomes located in terms of these processes of rearrangement, of continuously new kinds of, of, of entanglements. And also the extensions take place also at the level of the body in circulation. Bodies that find the effort to stabilize through consolidating place, acquiring access, maximizing consumption. This stabilization, as I said before, offers an increasingly limited horizon. It's too much labor too much indebtedness, too much compliance. And so social life and livelihood is increasingly distributed across multiple locations. The emphasis of itinerary over emplacement. So the urban is the constant recalibration of movement, constantly recalibrated by movement, even when people are stuck in one place and particular environments adamantly hold on. So even if it looks like people are stuck and people are not going anywhere, there's increasingly a sense of, of, of movement in place, of, of, of figuring out different, different kinds of performances, different kinds of ways of trying things on, different ways of presenting yourself. So even endurance is less a function of cemented ties of people to place, but a continuing reposition of place. You know, the relationship of tea stalls, restaurants, small factories to a shifting realignment of broken, broken details. And so the very brokenness allows for a kind of constant sense of, 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 of recombination. And so just to return now to, to just to step back into, to, to, you know, a quick, quick, quick history of space, of space in the city. So in some sense, the, the whole notion of urban modernity uh, was predicated on the subjection to perspectivism, both in the making of a subject, an urban subject, and the object of power. And this, in some sense, was predicated on the separating out of the individual from the social body, is the premise of the vanishing point from which perspectivism is imposed in the city congeals. So the vanishing point, this perspectivism is the kind of methodology in order to, of, of individuation to identify the sort of uniformity or identity of the constituent elements, orthogonal, equidistant units of analysis. So this, the, the sense the geometry of power is expressed in the very material form of the urban and that very material form of the urban predicated again on separating the individual body out from the, from the social body. And so returning to, to Ferreira da Silva, that spaciousness is different than without this kind of separability. And if you looked at the price of the, look at the price of the separation, the price of the separation was always Coercion was always violence, is, is, is what Ferrar de Silva points out. Because separation was always threatened by the instabilities in maintaining bodies and terrain as something detached, individualized. And thus property is the constriction of spaciousness. It's a reifi reification of freedom in terms of self-possession, something always wary of the possibilities of being possessed by other forces. So self-possession is fundamentally a kind of ambiguous, you know, one is, is required to take possession of oneself as property, but taking oneself as, as 
possessing oneself as property is in some sense always informed by the fear of being possessed by, by in some sense of other forces. Now, when she talks about differences without separability, it doesn't mean that things are not different. It doesn't mean that things are not detached, but detached in the sense that it's not possible to conceive of a form of attachment that would subsume differences within some overarching formulation that coheres and coordinates whatever those differences are capable of doing. So differences are not inseparable because they are unable to live without each other, but rather these differences avail to each other the very material and conceptual resourcefulness that enables their difference, their very capacity to operate as a difference to the stabilization of any specific proposition or state of, ex of existence. So in this some, se some sense, the, the, the notion of differences without separability as the underlining of spaciousness, not because they can't live with each other, but because in some sense they provide each other a resourcefulness that enables them to function as differences in the, in the first place. And so I want to I want to to in the last section here then talk about this in a, in, a, in a somewhat more concrete concrete way. Um, what 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 do I mean in some sense of differences without separability within the kind of context of of the of the extensions? And so here I take uh, one particular extension. Uh, which is to the southeast of Jakarta, now the world's largest urban region, uh, an urban region of 35 million people. Um, nine and a half million live within the official city limits of Jakarta. And so you can understand how many others are living at the extensions and the kind of way in, in which the sort of inversion of the predominance of the city form has taken place in terms of the primacy in some ways of, of the extensions. And this particular extension of Chikarang is in, in some sense, the, it includes all types of, 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 of super towns. There's a, there's a big super town called Mayakarta, which is in the process of being built uh, which is to accommodate 300,000 people uh, with 40 schools, six hospitals, five universities. Um, you have uh, one of the, uh, the largest industrial zones of, of, of Indonesia. You have a massive dry port. Uh, you, have, uh, you have still large volumes of arable farmland that's being farmed, even though the corpor large corporations and developers have the lease on it. Uh, you have mega towers, you have, you know, thousands and thousands of units of migrant hostels. You have every kind of imaginable built environment taking place next to each other. And the problematic here is that all of these things only partially work. That is, none of them work according, fully according to the plan in which they were, in which they were, they were built. So it's a kind of ambiguous situation of everything is sort of half full and, and, half, and, and half empty. And so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this kind of, this kind of situation where you have massive amount of money and effort and labor taking place in developing these kinds of extensions, but they only partly, and they only partly work. Here are some, here are some images of, you know, so, so, so in some sense, there is this kind of, uh, this, this intensive contiguity of very radically different kinds of dispositions and, and appearances. Now, all of these things, these, these dry ports, these super towns, these factories, these affordable housing, all of these discrete components, they, they circulate through each other across various databases and spreadsheets and future scenario plans and securitization tiers. 
So it's sometimes difficult to tell the extent to which the efficacy of these things is a slate of hand attained through the abstracted accountings of interoperability rather than more substantive synergies and mutually beneficial and reinforcing relations. So in somehow there, there are these different loci of what makes something work. One is through sort of the abstracted world of a financialized, of a plane of financialization. And the other is there real, real synergies between these kinds of built environments. And this is because even a cursory superficial analysis of these extensions point to large swathes of vacancies and undercapacity of continuously reworked financial infusions and the structural purposing of built environments. So functioning across markedly different temporal horizons, everything to be assessed falls under the belief that inevitably and eventually things will work according to the plan because the plan itself even though specifying the precise ways in which different spatial products are to be interrelated, in practice builds on the obsolescence of those very specifications. That is at the heart of the logic of strategic and spatial planning of these extensions is a built in sense that whatever is built is not going to work according to plan because it will only find its function in terms of things that are yet to be built, yet to be developed. So there's a continuous sense of a new neighborhood of, of spatial products and built environments that are gonna surround anything that gets put up and that these are always going to recalibrate and reshift what it is that that original built environment is going to do. So things remain in some sense fundamentally unsettled at the very core of the way in which these extensions are being developed even, for, even, for, even formally. So a kind of sense of, of, of unsettlement built into the very development of, of, of the extensions themselves. And also coupled with the sense that it doesn't matter now whether something is profitable or not. It doesn't matter if, if things don't seem to work. They will work, eventually something will happen to them. Eventually something will come of them eventually some use will be ma made of them. So it's a kind of sense of, 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 of a destination, of a specification, of a settlement that is always in this sense of yet, of yet to come. Uh, and, and in some sense, yeah. So I wish you want to, I'm gonna just have a, a, quick, a quick story about in some sense the subaltern, the, a subaltern inhabitants of this, of this particular space in, 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 in Chikara. So along the raised embankment of an irrigation canal that now separates corporately held agricultural land from the all, all, almost magical appearance of Mayakarta, that's the new development of a, of a quarter of a million people that's being developed, residents originally from the island of Madura across from Surabaya have long operated from hundreds of makeshift compounds with their various assortments of junk, found and stolen items, including steel beams, bags of concrete, broken door frames, thousands of bolt and screws dismantled from who knows how many infrastructural projects. So for them, you know, Chikaran is a paradise because it's you know, full of always ongoing construction sites from which they are able to accumulate this material. Renowned as artisans of the useless and providers of what anyone needs for almost any kind of project, the Maduris are the consummate archivists, rarely discarding anything and talking about and arranging their wares in such a way as to propose interconnections among things that might often seem outlandish and impossible, but nevertheless to an audience that seems to take many of these propositions sufficiently seriously to maintain these archivists, archivists in business. So a row of cheap migrant, ho migrant hostels, for example, that have been abandoned because of internecine conflict or simply bad positioning in face of flood drainage can be completely dismantled in a matter of hours 
and find the components reinserted in a wide range of repairs, house extensions, junk markets, and small factories before the day is over. The Maduris are not only collectors of materiality, but also cheap jobs as well. They won't usually do the jobs themselves because it impinges upon their sense of freedom, but they collect these jobs in order to distribute them to others. Jobs such as porters, janitors, cleaners, and security guards. The objective is not so much job placement per se, but brokering connections among different jobs as part of an expansive information network, which circulates updates about what is taking place across different factories, construction jobs, internal customs ports, and service centers. Such a network not only facilitates the just off the truck acquisitions of materials or the ability to offer quick solutions, material inputs to projects or operations facing unanticipated problems, but concretizes off-grid relations amongst places and functions. Those that do not fit into any of the prevailing conceptions about how things and places are to be connected with each other. So in some sense, the, 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 the Maduris are always, are always on, on, on the run. They have a very loose sense of any affiliation with, 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 with property. But yet you, you, you talk to Maduri, if you want to find out what's happening in Chikorong, um, at any level, if you want to, uh, if you want to find out what's happening you know, within the, the sort of offices of the, of the big developers, if you want to uh, find out what's off ha happening on, with the construction crews, if you want to ha find out what's happening within the local authorities, they know because they have, they have brokered this kind of distribution of jobs in all kinds of positions across this kind of landscape in a circuit of kind of impressions and information that in some sense offer the possibility of a whole new channel of, of inseparable differences. So when I say it's the, this, when I talk about a positing and materializing of off-grid relations, it's not conducted within the register of realizing <laughs> unexpected potentialities. It's not interested in, in, in developing an alternative world or inventive usage. Rather, it functions as an intensive artificiality, even a noise, a means of interrelating things not informed by a specific vision or even objective. It concerns an infusion of incomputable instrumentality in the intersection of the everyday experiences of hundreds of service workers and laborers across the landscape characterized by moving things around, constantly improvising where they might fit, disrupt, and supplement operations of almost any kind. And if I had more time, I, I, I would go into the ways in which this constitutes a kind of prototype. It constitutes a kind of beta for the way in which all these different kinds of built environments and spatial products within this particular extension have to make use of each other, have to repurpose themselves, have to become different than what they were intended to be in order to be able to continue to, to, continue to endure. Now we might construe such operations as complicit in the maintenance of the macro structures of urban capital accumulation and urbanization is a locus of advanced capital relations, since it seems to momentarily compensate for a proliferation of all kinds of dysfunctionalities. One could see it as a kind of cheap just-in-time provisioning of small affordances, fueling an already hypertensive neoliberal emphasis on everyone having a project. And these Maduri's operations could rightly be considered as a perpetuation of a kind of cruel optimism to, to use Berlant's terms. But in amplifying the essential brokenness of the world, of things out of their proper place, no matter where they end up or how they are used, this economy goes beyond reparation to highlight how that brokenness suggests its own propositions devoid of the will to restore functionality. The Maduris themselves known for breaking the integrity of projects, for repurposing elements from that brokenness, to dispositions they have little interest in defining, 
rather seek to perpetuate a state of brokenness as generative of a continuous circulation of materials across different hands, different sites, and different uses. Here, relations are proposed that are detached from obvious genealogy, that compress things conventionally viewed as impossible to be together, and that have no way of knowing whether they will endure or not. And this techno-poetics of relationality implicitly addresses the fundamentals of urbanization itself as a process simultaneously human and inhuman that does not proceed simply as an artifice of human will, but as a techne both with and without its own registers and affects. In other words, the technical dimensions of all the relationalities of urbanization come from all over the place and work in different degrees, proportions, and manifestations that come to be associated with it, but also do not intrinsically belong to it. And so in the extensions in some sense are that is this kind of, of locus of improper and inoperable relations of all kinds that in some sense deal with the brokenness of the orientation, the brokenness of a kind of mode of urban existence that has in some sense been prepared to be a kind of intensive theft of orientation. But within that theft of orientation, within the sort of space of the extensions, something else is taking place. Something else that in, in a way goes beyond our available vernaculars of analysis and intervention and become a kind of opening, an opening up to rethink what it means to inhabit in a different way. Thank you very much. Thanks, Abdul Malik. Um, that was uh, well, insightful, energizing, capacious. Um, it's got my head spinning a lot of different directions. So maybe um, as people are typing questions, um, I'll respond with one or two comments and maybe open, the, open up the conversation a little bit. Um, there's a lot of things that really struck me in that. One of which really stood out um, was your kind of articulation following uh, Ferreira da Silva of the idea of self-possession as a kind of defense mechanism. And the idea of this relationship between individuation and private property, and like explaining that in terms of a kind of self defense mechanism in the context of expanding brutality and extensions. I found that like really, really fascinating. The other thing that, which kind of ties in with um, a lot of the talks in the series, particularly um, Dev Cowan's talk, was the idea of articulating this relationship between detachments that are going on simultaneously with other kinds of entanglements and fostering of complicities. Um, this kind of discussion of, of kind of counter logistical or imagining infrastructures otherwise, if you like. Um, but maybe one thing I'd like to think about a bit further, if, if, if you've got the, uh, the space to expand on it, maybe would be um, a bit more on the question of temporality and um, the temporalities of the extensions. Um, you kind of alluded to at the beginning, the idea of finitudes. Um, um, but also the kind of the extensions as spaces of a kind of permanent sort of temporariness. Um, and I think, you know, it's a difficult question, maybe, but there are various kinds of temporariness um, going on. Much of your writing is kind of informed by um, uh, musical language um you're kind of influenced by jazz music and as well as kind of black radical thought on articulating the kind of temporalities and rhythms of urban spaces so i don't know if you'd have a bit more to say about that i'd be interested to hear that would be one question to start off with on, on the question of of temporality and rhythm in, in context of the extensions and then the second question um uh, just one more final comments would be to kind of open up the question of um people in the extensions who are treated as surplus in a particularly colonial way. Um, we're treated as surplus um, in sometimes contradictory ways. So there's a whole I mean, debate here, I think, about you know, the rise of surplus populations, which you might think back to kind of books by, say, Mike Davis from the 2000s, the likes of Planet of Slums, which described the kind of colonial, renewed colonial management tactics to deal with a, a population that's, that's deemed to be kind of surplus to demands of capital. And speaking about this today, it's obviously very difficult not to think of, you know, the situation of absolute brutality that Palestinians are confronted with, the kind of 
eliminationist logics of settler colonialism uh, that persists, where people are, are seen as being not even worthy of ex exploitation for work. Um, and I think that also ties into kind of a Shields narrative of a, of a becoming black of the world. But at the same time, there's a kind of other kind of dynamic, which is related. And it's a dynamic of a kind of differential inclusion that people like, like uh, Nielsen and, and Matadra talk about, where, whereby, you know, expanding informal labor markets um, um, go hand in hand with logics of, of surveillance. And there's not necessarily a dynamic of absolute expulsion, of total ejection of people from uh, capital accumulation or from, from markets, etc. And so for me, your account of the extensions didn't, I, I wasn't able to, I'm not able to quite articulate in the question, but it's helping me to see a kind of a connection between these two logics of absolute expulsion, but at the same time, a kind of differential inclusion that's going on. That's really absolutely kind of central, I think. Um, so I don't know if that makes any kind of sense to you or if you'd be able to, to jump off that, but there are just maybe two broad um, remarks or questions to, to kick things off. Um, Yeah, thank you, Eugene. Um, in terms of in terms of the, the of, of, temp of temporality, um, I mean, if if one 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 if one were to do a sort of genealogy of the way in which, say, these large swathes of extensions in you know, the, the, the images I, I showed of Calcutta or of, of Delhi or of, of, of Jakarta. Um, there, and, and, and if you go back like over, over the past sort of uh, three, three decades, um, It oftentimes is 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 amazing to see the extent to which um, I mean the far from there being nothing there I mean this the the, the land on which um, these extensions have been uh, elaborated um, was you know often, you know, in, in brutally uh, expropriated from people who had been residing there for, for, for generations. Um, and, and, in, and in the course of those 30 years, there, there have been markedly different practices that have been deployed in order to acquire, for example, that land sometimes under the, the use of eminent domain where there might have not been compensation, others through very graded, graduated scales of, of, of compensation, which, uh, which allowed through complicated brokerage mechanisms for some of those villagers to make a lot of money, uh, to develop, uh, for example, uh, cheap housing, migrant hostels for migrant labor, for new factories, um, um, but things that have come and gone. I mean, you have these sort of subsequent generations of, so you, you, you might have, a, a, you, you might have a, 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 a small farm that has endured for 30 years right next to a large plot of land that has already undergone five different kinds of projects during those 30 years. You know, five things that, that failed, five things that didn't work, five things that sort of um, made the wrong anticipation or, or were, were about to do things but couldn't quite come up with eno enough money to, to do them. So you, you have these, these spatial contiguities which mark um, which mark very different kinds of horizons of, of time and anticipation and expectation. Um, and so what, what I called in the presentation, these sort of differentials of, 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 of speed. Um, and, and, there, 
and oftentimes not under the kind of framework where the way in which they were to relate to each other, the way in which they were to talk to each other, the way in which they were to coexist each other was in any way framed by a kind of overarching planning process. They had to figure out their own, own ways to, to apprehend each other, to think about what is going on. And so you also have all these rapidly accreting layers of sedimentation as to what took place, what, what could take place, what will take place. Um, and so in the absence of that kind of, any kind of language of commonality, of consensus, of specification, um, you, you, you have the preponderance of, of what, what I would call a kind of baseline, baseline like a, a base, a musical baseline, um, uh, a kind of the, the, the importance of particular kinds of, of, of rhythms of appearance and disappearance. Uh, rhythms of things that are incomplete, but they're always, they seem to be always on the verge of completion. A few work, work people show up, you know, to keep the sense of things going. But you know that, you know, with one or two people, the thing's not going to be finished for the next 50 years, but yet there's a kind of ongoingness. And then there are right next to her things that, that, that there hasn't been any human being within that building except for some farmers taking their cattle across. So in, 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 in some sense, you have all of these different kinds of temporalities at, 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 at work under the pro overarching promise that everyone believes in some sense, no matter how dispossessed they might be, or no, no matter how angry they might be at the way that they've been treated, that eventually this is all going to work out Somehow, we're all going to have a, we're all going to find a, 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 a place. And so, but without a kind of sense of a, of a kind, with, with an active politics of ongoing negotiation, what people rely upon is this sense of, of how one, of rhythms, of, of countervailing consonant rhythms that are taking, that, 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 are, take, that are taking place. Uh, within this sort of overarching sense of 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 of, of, event, of eventually, um, you know, where 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 some farmers who 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 took their compensations, they invested in businesses, they made a lot of money, then they lost the money, then they borrowed to do another thing, they made some more money, they lost the money, now they feel that they're really screwed, but yet they continue to say uh, things are okay, things are all things are all right, um, something will happen. Um, and, and so in that's, that's, that sense of a kind of baseline, you know, it's not, not a baseline in terms of like the B-A-S-E-L-I-N, not a kind of consolidation from which things come together and then take, take off but a sense of all of these different kinds of countervailing rhythms that in some sense impact upon what it is possible for people to think might happen and what they and, and, and what and what they and what they might do. Um, and I think that, that that also begins to address this kind of notion of, you know, others have talked about it as exclusionary inclusion and inclusionary exclusion, you know, that 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 in some ways that those that are that are oftentimes marginalized uh, and seemingly excluded are dependent upon using that space to come up with thing, different ways of doing things that could be appropriated in the future as important resources when things don't work out elsewhere. And the ways in, in which a kind of inclusionary exclusion happens when people are brought into, you know, like, you know, the, the, the way in which all of these people who buy, you know, you know, spend thirty-five, forty thousand dollars to buy a kind of cheap pavilion that won't last for fifteen years, but they feel like they have an asset. They're homeowners. They're brought into the system. They're brought into a kind of formalized status. But in in some ways, it it is 
it is exclusionary because it doesn't give them a kind of platform from which to work from. Um, all of the kinds of um, messy workarounds and wheeling and dealing that they might have found possible within other kinds of urban contexts, within these new situ situations, they, they spend hours commuting or they spend most of their income paying off debt for something that will, ne will, will never last, 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 last anyway. So the, the thing is, 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 is that the, and, and because the, and, and then you have this, this, this simultaneity where the extensions become the kind of bearers and harbors both for the, the, the built environments which are supposed to embody the new urban and all of its new capacity, but they're also supposed to embody those that have been evicted from other parts of the city, those that have nowhere else to go. And so in some sense, you have the simultaneity and oftentimes the intensive proximity of these two very different, of these very two very different trajectories. And, and as I was trying to suggest is, is that in, in some ways, the way in which those that are marginalized and evicted deal with their new situations often become prototypes for the way in which more high-end environments are able to think about how they can continue and endure during a time when their own precarity you know, they, they face their own precarity, although a very different form of precarity. If I didn't address everything, just remind me of, uh, because you cut out for a few minutes, Eugene, so I didn't hear all of the, all of the questions. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, no, that makes sense. And I mean, it relates to kind of what I had in mind in the sense that as well as the sum of the more kind of um, spectacular forms of, um, uh, let's say, abjection or kind of throwing off peoples from, from labor markets, there is also more kind of, um, you know, subtler forms of day class mourn, of kind of lower middle classes being proletarianized and this, these kinds of dynamics, which have a kind of relation that you're really helpfully kind of articulating to. Um, but yeah, I think um, there's some questions going in. So maybe I'll put these two in the box. Um, I think my connection was a little bit unstable. Can you hear me okay, Abdomalik? Or is it, am I back now? It's a little unstable. Yeah, you come in and out, Eugene. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll maybe read the first question, then try and find a better space here to, to get closer to my um, Wi Fi box. So maybe to start off, um, I'll go to. Um, Joseph Heathcott, uh, first question, who says, as always, I find your framing and conceptualization of socio-space relations to be brilliant and illuminating. If it's not time for new commitments to a rather old fashioned thing, a descriptive project where we begin to work through and test and adjust theory to detail these inversions, unsettlements, dexterities, and incommensurate simultaneities. Yeah, Joe, I mean, it, I think that um, yeah, I mean, this, this is what I this, I guess this is what I what I'm what I'm suggesting is that in, 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 in some ways you 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 have all of these details in some ways that have been um, both evicted and freed up from particular kinds of overarching frameworks about what are the kind of critical urbanization processes. Um, I don't think we, necessarily have to to uh, to abandon um, a sort of analytical framework but I but I do think that 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 given what I'm suggesting about the particular composition of these extensions that there's no choice but to try to uh, 
find ways to 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 describe uh, even speculatively, even inventively. I mean, it's an opportunity. It's a, it's an opportunity to think about relationalities in in oftentimes real ex experimental ways. Um, because empirically, we're not in some sense constrained by overarching evidence of one particular trajectory or, 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 or another. Um, yes, I mean, one, uh, I mean, I, that's why I'm saying I, I take the opportunity of a built environment, which is half works and half doesn't as an opportunity an opportunity to think experimentally about what are the different kinds of relationships that are possibly taking place rather than to immediately attribute it to the, the limitations inherent within uh, an urbanization project largely driven through the production of urbanization itself, which is, you know, which is partly a completely financialized process. So yeah, I would, I, 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 Joe, I would, I, I, would I would agree. And, and you are one of our shining examples of the, of, of the ability to, to do this. Thanks, apologies for my patchy connection, everyone. I think I've found a better spot now. So um, continuing with the questions then, um, next is from Tanya, who asks, um, where do extensions lie in separations in the ways lifestyles are framed over time by the quote, markets and architectural profession, which continuously fetishizes and abandons as the waves of demand change, where extensions themselves are pocketed as a separate built environments from the city. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, I mean, when I when I when I indicated before that that part of the part of the the extension of the of, of a kind of colonial sensibility was in these in the production of a sense of enclosure that is unimpeded from the the kinds of messy negotiations that are require that otherwise are you know, attributed to the, the, the city, um, the ways in which um, many of these, many of these real estate projects are marketed as, uh, yes, you can belong to the, you, you can belong to the world. And architecture then tries, comes in to try to provide a kind of design and materialization of this kind of connectedness to a larger world, be part of a larger world, be part of something that is uh, beyond the kind of, 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 of local impediments and local specificities, um, which is a lure, obviously it's clearly a kind of Clearly, a kind of lure for for many investors, many many residents, uh, the opportunity to begin anew. But in the actual, but in the actual implementation of these things, the, in the actual running and operation of these things, of, of course, some 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 are able to to do this. You know, there is an alignment of alignment of money and political connections and dispossession and buy-in and compliance and to 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 materialize this kind of imaginary but in many instances it doesn't it doesn't happen uh, and when it doesn't happen in order to recuperate some kind of sense of vi viability, things have to be repurposed. And the repurposing comes in some sense through how, what ways can you then uh, 
manage these interfaces, these strange interfaces with things that don't seem to go together, things that don't seem to belong uh, with a discrepant. Um, and it is here then that a kind of intensification of an urbanizing process then would seem to, would seem to, to continue. Um, where again, things are not consolidated or, or, or defined for, for sure. You know, maybe, maybe at some point in, in the future, it will all settle, it will all work out that there will be sufficient money and political apparatuses uh, brought to, to, to bear. Um, but there is something about this process of extending that, and, and, and the kinds of divergent trajectories and functions that they're supposed to bear, um, which at this point, I think remains, does remain fundamentally uh, un, un, unsettled. Uh, and therefore you have um, the emergence of improbable conversations between middle-class residents and farmers and uh, day workers and migrants uh, around how to manage things of the, the incompletion of a road. Uh, or the, the, the spillage of sewage that runs off into a field because it's not proper, it's not properly, has not been properly managed. Um, yeah. Okay, um, there's two questions uh, broadly concerned with um, theory as well. So I might put them to you uh, together. Um, the first one is from Inji, who comments, uh, thank you, Prof. Simone, for this beautiful talk. Always so inspiring, useful, imaginative. Um, my question is for you, what is a theory? What do you think a theory does? For whom? For what? Or more projectively, what do you think a theory should do? Thank you very much. And then a second um, comment slash question from Mamen El Husni, um, a little bit further down who writes, thank you, Malik, that was fascinating. My prompt provocation question is the following. For the mass population of the global south to live and die in the same lifetime or multiple times is an embodiment to act, reach, morph and transform the anchors upon which you hold on, let go or relationally refigure the urban extension. How can we reproduce theory from the moving bodies that recalibrate time and its being as we know it? On a side note, missing you a lot. It's quite refreshing to see you and hear you. I mean, if you, if you, if, 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 for, if, for example, you, what, what was, um, what was also often surprising to me in my, my, my own research work, um, was the sense that you had. Uh, you had districts, you had places that had been built over time by residents themselves, auto-constructed places, where it wasn't a matter of building a house, but it was building a kind of urban atmosphere, it was building an urban machine, it was building a kind of interlinked, complementary, uh, collective engine of, of, of settlement, of inhabitation. And the question I, I would have is why in, in many instances within the past years is this intentionally being um, vacated um, in favor of a much more provisional and tenuous position at the extensions? It wasn't that people didn't continue to value what they had built. It wasn't that they didn't continue to value the kind of deep relations and the attainments that they had made over, 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 over decades. Um, I mean, of course, there were oftentimes complaints about the amount of labor involved. There were complaints about the, the greater vulnerability that they faced in light of, 
uh, maneuvers of remaking and gentrifications and development. There was the, the sense of um, a kind of tenuousness in terms of the intensifying individualization of everyday life, the difficulty in sustaining kind of collective effort. But more than anything, what was, what was always interesting to me was their saying, um, we're doing this because although we value this, this is important to us, um, it is not the position for which we're going to be prepared to understand what is expected of us and what's coming. That is, in order for us to know what is coming, to be prepared, to think about what it is that we're supposed to do and can do, we have to put ourselves into a position which enables us a different view, a different kind of positionality, a different sense of things. So instead of our work and our money and our effort, being in terms of continuously to consolidate this place of settlement. We opt out of this for a more provisional position at the, within the extensions, which we don't see as a destination. We're not going to put our energies in consolidating this piece of land or building a house or building a business. We're going to keep things loose. We, we don't expect all of that much from, from this, but it enables us a position in which to think more clearly about where the urban is going. And so if you ask about th theoretical, this is a position of which they're attempting to develop a theory. That is where they, are presently positioned and situated, they feel is a position which impedes upon the capacity to effectively and concretely theorize where things are headed. That in order to adequately theorize, they need to be able to go around. They need to be able to expand their their, their interrelationships with the larger urban area. They need a kind of position of looseness, um, even brokenness, uh, in order to be able to have a kind of perspective which will inform them as to, as to what to do. And so I, I use this example is, is that, it, that in some ways, the, the, the theory that I'm talking about here emerges from this sense of this interstice between, in some sense, finding a difficult time orienting oneself. Who are we? What is the we? What is a we? Um, a kind of theft of orientation. And a, kind, and, and a way of dealing with that, which is in some sense volitionally trying to put yourself into a position which best enables you to live and think through that absence of orientation in order to re-piece together some different form of what it means to be a we, what it means to be engaged in a kind of collect, co collective life. And so you have this kind of emergence of people operating in concert, but not through, in some sense, sharing a particular territory, but in their circulations with each other, coming to, in some sense, using all different kinds of tools to try to operate in concert, but from different kinds of positionalities across different kinds of spaces. Um, and that, so that's the space of a kind of active theorization from these particular kinds of volatile in interstices where you are both to a certain extent dispossessed, but you also yourself risk a certain dispossession at the same time in order to, in some sense, do a kind of thinking which is both speculative, pragmatic, uh, 
perhaps more day by day, but which is after a kind of a kind of point of view, where you're not buying into whatever is on offer. You're not you're, you, already you you are whatever is on offer. You're increasingly not buying into it. You see its limitations. You see somehow how it's going to play out, but you don't have a kind of sense of what kind of an alternative universe is really possible for you. You know you might have to try to put that together yourself and with others in a particular different way, but you don't yet have in some sense the tools for it. And so you have to have this sort of space of a provisional of, of kind of provisional experimentation. And to me then this notion of the extensions embodies this kind of, this kind of, 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 of moment. Hey, Abdi Malik, I'm going to put together two more questions for you here. Um, firstly, from uh, Matthew, who writes, uh, thank you for opening into the extensions where much thought is possible. I was wondering whether you'd be fine to give your take on how new urbanization processes, maybe also creating liminal zones. And he says, I use liminal in this sense of being spaces to sever into, into a space where there are imagines new coordinates but as distinct from the anthropological liminal. Here in the everyday urban, one may not be able to join back. Thus, at least one sees in cases from Indian subcontinents, the urban space becomes a permanent severance. And then there's a comment from um, an anonymous attendee who writes, um, as an Indonesian, I found that what you described about Jakarta, Shikarain, Makerta, was somehow not really um, special or somehow already sedimented in my or our everyday minds but once you deliver this it feels like oh yeah i never thought about it like that how did you think about it kind of describing maybe a process of, of, of defamiliarization um what do you think about this um is this the kind of thing that might be a task of an urban scholar I think you're on mute, uh, Malik. Trying to re ah. read. Uh, I'm trying to read Matthew's question again. Sure. Yeah. 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 I mean, you might. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is. Uh, I mean, this is. I mean, this Matthew's what Matthew's saying. This is the. I mean, this this is the risk. I mean, the the risk is in these interstices of of of, of multiple dispossessions. You might not come back. I mean, you, there's may not be any place to come back to the. Uh, and and for for some, it is a it is a it is a severance. Um, we we don't uh, people disappear. Uh, people disappear without a trace. Uh, uh, I mean, with, for example, in, in Jakarta, you have, you know, traditionally a kind of uh, system where, you know, uh, 12 to 24 households are managed by, you know, the, the, the basic local authority who records deaths and births. And, you know, so it's sometimes difficult for anyone to, to disappear. But at the extensions where where these kinds of authorities are not yet really sedimented, or where there's a kind of um, there's a kind of unwillingness to take it on, people do disappear. You you know people will tell you they've people don't, don't they don't know what 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 what, what has happened. Um, and I, and so the risk is of the, of the of 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 this kind of severance of this kind of detachment. Um, I mean, look at look at look at the, the you know the, the 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 intensification of the way in which people are made expendable. Um, uh, expendability is um, is I mean, if if anything, this this past year of, of of pandemia has has demonstrated the ways in which people can be easily expendable. 
and the banking of many of many metropolitan areas on the capacity to absorb death, to absorb the fact that there has been this kind of expend, expendability. So there's no there's no there's no there's no deni denying that. Um, but it, it is it is this kind of it is this kind of dilemma, you know. How do you make your existence count for something? Um, how do you make your? I mean, I mean, the 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 thing that that uh, in a talk that Catherine McKittry gave a couple of weeks back, where she said, you know, people, you want to make yourself visible. You you want to count for something. You want to, in some sense, come to the stage and say something and 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 make your existence useful for someone for yourself. But how do you also avoid the count? How do you avoid necessarily being interpreted and apprehended as a body that carries with it particular kinds of affordances or availability? Um, how do you avoid the, the, how do you avoid being representative of, of something that's in some sense beyond your control? How do you circumvent this need for everything to have some kind of quantitative value in terms of your, of your contributions? So in some sense, again, the extensions become this kind of arena, this kind of problematic, this kind of challenge, this kind of imperative of how you make yourself count how you continuously attempt to attach yourself to a kind of world that's beyond you, but how do you also detach from a world which in some sense imposes a particular count upon you at the same, same time? So again, this sort of simultaneous attachment, and this is again what, what I find so, so generative about in some sense uh, Ferrero de Silva's notion because in some sense, it talks about what what the 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 affordances that everything provides each other, uh, the untapped potentialities that are afforded by the fact that things, particularly things, exist despite the kind of disparate power arrangements that that take place. Which is why, you know, in some sense, I, I I ended with this thing about the Madura, which the Madura are, you know, the within the sort of Indonesian context are the the people that are sort of despised or seen as 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 outside of everything, you know, severed from any kind of of, of use. Uh, but to invert that and to say that they provide this kind of important beta, this prototype. Um, that actually posits the kinds of information systems uh, and, and modes of relationality, uh, which in some sense make this kind of extension viable and work uh, in productive ways. Um, and in terms of, oh yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, for if, if one is a Jakarta resident, you, you, I mean, you know, I mean, as I said before, the extensions are also embodied in, 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 in the lives of particular, of, of each in, in individual. So in some sense, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm talking about something that doesn't sound very new, well, that's, that's part of the point I'm making is that in some sense, this possibility, this, that, that, that these kinds of problematics these kinds of practices and challenges of everyday inhabitation are, are lived through in the very kind of sense of how you feel and see uh, and, 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 and move. Um, and, in, and in some ways, if particular kinds of descriptions and theorizations are, are able to in some sense surprise at a particular moment, offer an unanticipated surprise into something which is completely normal and expected, then I think that's how an urban scholar does his or her job. That problematic he described from uh, Catherine McKittrick about how to be kind of um, 
sort of visible and seen to to count for something but not to be a piece of the counting um kind of resonates with your use of uh, Gleason's opacity as well like the idea of you know you can be visible but not accessible transparent or penetrable for logistics or surveillance capitalism or or the dynamics some of which you described today um we're coming up to six o'clock and i'm probably not going to chance to go through everyone's questions so i apologize in advance but um malik would you be happy enough to take one more question to finish off sure eugene i'll take one more yeah I'm okay yeah sorry we've <laughs> put a lot to you today <laughs> Um, so the final question then from Astrid, who writes, thank you for this very interesting talk. I'm particularly interested in the notion of fragmentation or difference without separation that's been put forward and which you just uh, expanded a bit on just now. And um, my question relates to this issue, but from the perspective of the contact points or interstitial spaces that allow the relationality between the parts. How do you interpret these in between spaces? Can we inquire them as potential spaces of negotiation? Or experimental spaces or even perpetual paces spaces of stagnation thank you i mean this is this is partly the thing you know when you when you when you when you when you have extensions that are the in some sense the recipients and the staging grounds uh and the bearers of so many different trajectories of both imagination, of money, of expectation, of different kinds of actors with very disparate capacities and powers who all then materialize something or rematerialize something or repurpose something. Um, largely without, as I said before, an overarching plan that specifies what their relationships are. Uh, you, you create these kinds of in-betweens that are sometimes haunted, sometimes dead zones, you know, that, uh, that no one uses sometimes zones that are environmentally unusable because they've been in some sense ruined by the, the way in which different kinds of projects come, come together. Uh, you have some that are just simply parallel play, you know, used at different times of day by different actors, which are oftentimes without a great deal of negotiation. It just sort of happens according to sort of the temporal rhythms of things. Uh, you have people that cross and intersect uh, without acknowledging each other. Uh, at other times you have intense sort of negotiations over who can use what in what way. Um, at other times you find this, this kind of uh, these kinds of informal compacts, uh, which allow a sense of we will share this, we will manage this uh, together. Um, but it is simply the sort of the, the, the inherent volatility of these kinds of in-between points of, con of contact, uh, which are not yet enclosed which are not yet encroached upon which are not yet i mean and 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 they are and many of them are many of them are subject to fences and gates and enclosures and proprieties and all kinds of things which limit their accessibility um, but there are still a surfeit of these kinds of interstices where things continue again to be unsettled and to continue to be the locus of things being 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 work, 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 worked out. Um, so in some sense I, the, it, 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 it is these these intensifications of these different trajectories, the intensification of, 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 of the trajectory to, to privatize, to enclose, to develop some the the all the the the, the imaginary, the all comprehensive, uh, 
the clean, the, the unmessy. Uh, but what I'm trying to emphasize is that in the process of attempting to implement these kinds of imaginaries, the byproduct oftentimes is the kind of surfeit of the very things that these, uh, these, these projects attempt to circumvent. And then how do we, how do we, as Joseph, how do we describe these kinds of processes? How do we use them? How do we engage them as a kind of means for a different kind of, a different kind of, of, of disposition, a different notion of what it means to, to inhabit? Malik, thank you so much. You've been really generous with your time and it's been brilliant to get the opportunity to listen to you this afternoon. Um, I also want to say thanks very much to everyone for tuning in. And as ever, thanks to Eric Erdl for uh, tech support with the events. Um, yeah, so as I said, this is the last uh, events in this Theory in Crisis series for this year. But we'll be doing a, a related series um, um, from September, October. Um, keep an eye on the program. We've already got, uh, as I said, a really exciting list of speakers uh, shaping up. So um, I wish everyone a good evening, good weekends, and take care. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Eugene. Thanks for, everyone for tuning in. Yeah.